Hi, this is Vince Mendoza, and you're listening to Jazz Is Not What You Think. Hi, I'm here today with Vince Mendoza, one of my favorite composers, arrangers, conductors, performers, recording artists. Uh, and uh, we're here to talk about his new album. But before we get into the new album, uh, how you doing, Vince? Uh, it's great to be here, Michael. Uh, Yet another rainy day in in Los Angeles, so I, I'm I'm a little, you know, I'm I'm shut in my office, and you know maybe I'll move the pencil a little bit, but um, I'm missing <laughs> the sunshine. Well, I I'll, money I'll, back. <laughs> well, I'll keep you captive then. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you know, one of the first things I wanted to ask you is is, is there was a quote on your website. Uh, uh, I believe it was from Aristotle at the uh, music has the power of producing a certain effect on moral character in the soul. And I remember hearing that quote before. It's a pretty famous. Quote. Well, it was and on my, my website. I thought it was on your website. Uh, <laughs> maybe as may, it may have been a quote from someone describing your music as a review on your website, whether it was on your website. Now I'm, I'm starting to rethink that. Um, a good one. Though. One of the things yeah, it's a great one. And and one of the things that struck me about your music early on, and I was introduced to you in the in the mid nineties, um, is the visceral effect that it has when you listen to it. It's they're not just tunes. Um, they're rich, they're sometimes complex, and then sometimes beautifully simple. Um what is it about your style that brings that out, not only in the way you compose and arrange, but in the performers that you select to be on your album or on their albums? Well, when we're making records, we generally pick the people that, that we think will resonate most with, with what we're trying to say musically. And, and hopefully we're successful in that endeavor. It doesn't always happen, obviously, but... <laughs> Um, sometimes people choose musicians that they like to be with and then they figure out what their language is, is going to be. Um, most of the time on, on my records, uh, I choose the people that I think will, will resonate the most um, with the music. But, I, you know, to answer your first question, uh, you know, I grew up uh, listening to the radio you know, when I was a child, you know, it was Me all too. about the the pop and R and B songs and the the emotion that I felt from listening to those songs, but also the emotion of the artist and the the function of the of the melodies and and how they reached me. And uh, I wasn't so much concentrating on the words at the time. It was really about the sound of the, the melodies and the instruments in particular, you know, cause I, I grew up around the time of the, the, uh, the Philadelphia, uh, soul period mm -hmm. as well. And the use of the, of the orchestral instruments and the, and, you know, Tom Bell's use of the, the, uh, the French horns and, you know, glockenspiel and of course, Bert, uh, Bert's, uh, orchestrations brought in that as well. But, for me, it was the, the melodies and, and the types of harmonies they were using that really reached me um, as, a, as a human. And so it was a sort of natural uh, approach when I was writing to bring that out. It wasn't so much calculated as just what I felt. And, and you, you know, it, it, since we're talking about your early days, you... Um... You, I understand you started in film and TV uh, in your earliest work. Um, do you, can you recall any of those shows that you were working on and what were you doing then that's so much different than what you do now? Um, well, you know, film and TV was my aspiration when I came to Los Angeles, but it generally wasn't something I was doing um, all the time and certainly not before I got there. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was really focused on my own music and i put a band together in la which is where i met a lot of the people that play uh on sessions and concerts with me now you know we're the, mm. the original vince mendoza big band members in, <laughs> in the 80s uh and i was really focused on my own music but i wanted to be part of the uh the film 
music community. And I was always a, uh, I'm still a, a great fan of, of movies. And, and um, so uh, I tried to, to get into that scene, but it, it's, it's, as you know, very insular and, um, and quite competitive. And, um, you know, I guess like, like any industry, it, it's, it's a fairly close knit uh, group of people. So I, I, at the beginnings of, of my time in Los Angeles, I met some uh, people who were working in television and they gave me a chance to, to, to write on some of those shows. And um, so I got some experience uh, writing for television and, and working in the studios there, but I, I found also that it was, was uh, quite stressful the the, <laughs> the 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 schedule of of production for those uh, shows that use orchestras were you know very short so the, the composer who was assigned to the show w would generally start panicking around tuesday yeah. of the week and then the recording was thursday uh you know and then they would air it uh you know maybe the monday after or something like that uh, mm -hmm. so the, timeline was very short and um you were having to compose a mountain of music in a very short amount of time which is not comfortable yeah and then i would turn around and, and work on a pop record and we would spend a, a day working on the snare drum sound so it's you know, a completely different uh discipline and and level of <laughs> of stress yeah. involved so but, so now yeah. that i was gonna say now that you have you know a multitude of not only credits but al uh, albums with your uh, imprimatur on the album uh, under your belt do you still yeah. get calls occasionally to do a movie because i remember for example a friend i'm sure you know as well bob james uh he had yeah. a, several albums and then all of a sudden the people from taxi said we'd like to have some let's get that guy and then that be that launched him in right it, it basically launched his career right right so was that, th but the theme from that show was not from one of his records. Did he make the record after the, after the show or? I think, I think the, I think the way I understand the way Bob described to me years ago was they were familiar with his CTI work. Uh, and someone on the show loved his albums. They loved that sort of contemporary, you know, you know, just bright sound. Right. And, and, and they, and they asked him to, contribute the uh, theme song of which it then appeared on his album touchdown so okay. i think you're right i think it appeared on his album after after it was a hit and then of course yeah. that helped launch that as his biggest right. selling album at the time right. because everyone knew the tv show yeah and he was do he was working on on movies as well he i think maybe your viewers can correct me i invite that but i think that he did uh, a lot of the orchestrations for serpico mm. Um, and you yeah, can sort of hear it, you know, go to that scene where the where the police are meeting in the park and, and sort of talking about their situation. Mm -hmm. And um, you can hear in the background these hip uh, chords and orchestration going on. And, and that was Bob yeah. Yeah. So doing stuff then, too. But to answer your question, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it hasn't it hasn't happened but you know i fell into the the project with Lars frontier and um and bjork uh because of of my association with bjork at the time and and she got called to do the movie and and um and she asked me to work on it with her but i didn't really encounter lars at all you know we just mm -hmm. did it did the music and then they filmed it after the music was done so I, I didn't really have much of an encounter and then maybe i had a few licenses of, of songs from records that appeared in the movies that you know love actually is a good example mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. but um i think that the that the the movie business and that community is not connected that much to to uh jazz composers and and you know, maybe that was happening in the '70s a little bit. Don Ellis, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and yeah. then um, uh, before that with Quincy and Pat Williams and uh, yeah, Lalo Schifrin and you know those guys. So speaking of those guys, and any of your favorites of, of the, the I call them the soundtrack guys that were just doing lots of soundtracks at the time, whether it was Lalo or who? You have any oh, favorites? Wow. Um, 
Well, uh, yeah, Lalo and, and uh, you know, Quincy's uh, uh, 1960s mm -hmm. um, uh, movies, uh, you know, Ellington's famous Anatomy of a Murder score. Sure. You know, that's that's a beautiful score. And, uh, and Miles' uh, uh, Elevator to the Gallows. Yeah. Uh, and, um, wow. Yeah, there were a few of them. I, I still love Don Ellis's score to the French Connection. Sure. And sure. Death Wish. Really? You know, I yeah. mean, Herbie did maybe a small handful of movies, right? To blow out, and, and mm -hmm. there's another one. I don't know, maybe you'll know, but, but um, you know, the ones that he did were, were quite notable because you still hear his signature um, sound. Yeah. Uh, in the, in the, um, in the music, you know, it, it doesn't uh, get generic. It, it's still Herbie in there. Oh, absolutely. So when I realized that what a genius you were, and I, and I, I don't mean that to be patronizing. I, I, I it, your music is, is really very special to me. It was actually uh, a, a friend, again, a mutual friend uh, sent me an album called Epiphany. And that was Ricky mm -hmm. Schultz. And Ricky sends me this album. Um, yeah, I said, yeah, I've heard of Vince before. I, and I, I've liked everything I've heard. But when I listened to that album, I really heard not only the brilliance in composition and arranging, but how you pulled the best out of all of those players. Mm -hmm. And I use it as an example of that album. When people say, you know, they like Michael Brecker, can you play something like that's going to knock my socks off? It's from your album. When they want to hear, say, John Abercrombie, I always liked him. I say, you got to hear him play on Vince Mendoza's Epiphany. You right. manage to get, it's like the best sounds and playing from those artists all on one album. Yeah. You know, the, the, the funny thing is, Michael, that the, the solos that, that I get, by and large, for my records um, were very early takes, you know, and the earlier ones, you know, start here and instructions were, mm -hmm. you know, they were not overdub affairs. I mean, technically, you know, at the start here and instructions, we did all of the electronics beforehand, mm -hmm. sent the uh, tapes to New York and the band, the entire band played to the tape. So the, in a sense, the whole thing was an overdub, but the solos were done live with the rhythm section. And we only really did, two or three takes and some of them were wow. first takes that we used on the record so the solos were the immediate reaction to the feeling that they get from the music and there wasn't a lot of time for calculation and construction and that's when you know the instrumentalists that are watching this you start thinking about well i'll play this on this chord and this on that chord and and you start getting a little self-conscious about Mm -hmm. uh, that solo is going to be put together, but these were were done uh, live with very uh, you know early takes that you hear on the record. So, with the exception of Mike and um, and Joe and Kenny, those solos on Epiphany were were done with the orchestra. And I have to say that an especially big hat is taken off to to those soloists. Um, for playing so beautifully under the pressure of having the orchestra there. And, you know, this is the take, don't blow it. You know, that, you know, we didn't have, you know, I would have felt that certainly, but, um, you know, they played such beautifully uh, crafted, emotional, uh, composed live solos with the orchestra. Uh, and I think it's, it's partly due to them feeling the emotion of the song and, and what they mm -hmm. have to contribute to it. Yeah. In fact, um, may he rest in peace. Uh, John Abercrombie. Uh, I was backstage with him at, uh, I had, there was a jazz's club in Boca Raton. And of course I wanted him to perform there. Yeah. And uh, we talked about uh, his playing on your albums. Yeah. And the one thing he said was, man, those are tough sessions. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But but you listen to it and, you know, it's I guess it's it's one of these things that I, I kind of say a lot. And that is the really great musicians 
make it sound like it's not incredibly difficult. It, it just, they're able to execute. Right. And he's a perfect example of that. I mean, I can only imagine, as you just said, how difficult it was to come in and, and, and read and do that in one or two, three takes maybe. And, right. and, 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 and Michael Breck, Mike Brecker, the same thing. I mean, I mean, that Mike yeah. is, you know, I've always said he's, he's, he's truly, I've always, and I get in trouble for this a lot. Cause I said, he's, he's one of the greatest saxophonists who ever lived. And, you know, then whenever I say musicians. that, I say, yeah, musicians, I, I get the people say, well, how about this guy and this guy? I'm like, Oh no, no, I'm not saying they're not great. I'm saying I've never met a musician who can play as out and as, you know, brilliant on a fairly complex or avant tune and then do a solo to a pop song and do them right. both absolutely brilliantly. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I was one of the blessed, you know, you know I, a lot of people knew Mike, but I got to hang with him a little bit um, yeah. back in the nineties. And I, I have a great Mike story that I love to tell because you know him well as I'm sure better than I did. And, uh, he called me one day after hearing a bassoonist named Paul Hansen. I know Paul too. Yeah, he's amazing. And Paul, yeah, and Paul, Paul entered Hansen. a comp. Yeah, he entered a competition that we had at Jazz Is, where uh, Mike and David Murray and Eddie Daniels were the judges uh, for the Woodwinds. And Mike calls me one day and he says, uh, "Hey, Michael, who, who's this guy, Paul Hansen?" Hmm. And I said, "You like him?" And he said, "Like him." He, he's almost as good as me. <laughs> and, and if you knew how humble Mike was for him to say that, it yeah. was just my, mind blowing to me. Yeah. He, he, he approached everything with a great sense of, of humility you yeah. know, and, and beauty and, and peace, you know, and it's sometimes uh, hard to believe when you hear, hear him hitting it hard sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but he was really a very humble, beautiful person. Yeah. And, uh, always his ears were always open. You know, what's that? You know, um, that yeah. sense of, of curiosity and, and, and wonder. And it doesn't surprise me that he was turned on by, uh, by this amazing bassoon player, you know, yeah. and you know, when Paul does the electronics with the bassoon, it's He's incredible. He's at a he's at a different level. It's just yeah. So and Mike was was really into um, uh, Bulgarian music. Yeah, um, yeah. Toward the end of his life, he was um, you know thinking about doing a, a a record with this group Farmers Market, as you may know, and, mm -hmm. and, and that that I think they did some tracks, but I don't. The record didn't come out. Uh, so his his ears were always open, and but I, they one other thing to add to that is it's easy to underestimate uh, uh, how difficult it is for somebody to to play an amazing solo with such perfection but under pressure um and, and have to read a part um and know that there's other people in the room and you know there's so many aspects of it that we really have to appreciate when we hear a recording like epiphany or whatever you know the, these uh ensemble recordings the brecker brothers thing or that you know you can start your instructions and and olympians that you know they have have a, a such an amazing sense of of providing this level of perfection but uh, above and beyond it their creativity and, and energy and it's it's really extraordinary to watch in the studio too i don't know how they do it i, I really yeah. By it. yeah me too uh, another artist that um you know after i thought i'd heard the best of john schofield you make the album 54 with him and it, it's i i couldn't stop listening to it it's just yeah. it's incredibly beautiful john's playing is at its best uh the compositions the arrangements how was it to make that album it seemed like that was a difficult album to make no and no. not at all. It was okay. really a wonderful process. Uh, in fact, that was one of the few records that we played with the Metropole 
or cast that we recorded in the afternoons. And I, I don't really remember why we did it, but usually the sessions are 10 to two. And so 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you know, to make a jazz record or, or, you know, flamenco or, or African record at 10 in the morning is, mm -hmm. is asking for trouble. But, you know, we did our <laughs> sessions in the evening. And so the vibe was, was so much easier and more energetic and, uh, the solos were great and the you know the band was tight and the, the the orchestra felt felt comfortable and um i really sort of felt that 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 we should always change the the schedule of the orchestra to to meet in the evening hours because we would get the best stuff out of them hmm. and so i felt that no those sessions were were very easy john knows the songs they were they were his songs yeah. And we took care not to, to really uh, redefine the songs from how they existed in, uh, in terms of their vibe and you know rhythmic things and the changes. And so we we made it easier for John to to step into the process. And um, mm -hmm. so I think he felt comfortable. Of course, we worked together for many years before that, so he was familiar with with how I roll and, and, mm -hmm. and um, so it was a, it was a great time. And, and Jonathan Allen did the, did the mm -hmm. mix. Um, and uh, he did a, a wonderful job with that. So um, yeah. Beautiful album. So that, that brings me to, you know, you, Mike Brecker, obviously I could tell you love Joe Zawinul, um, uh, you know, all these fusion artists, um, I, I, in, in some ways it's a paradox because you have this big band orchestral symphonic, and then you have this fusion side where a lot of these, the, the, literally the best artists that c could be considered in the fusion genre performing with you. So I kind of think of your music as sort of a fusion. And of course, the fact that you do jazz and rock and pop and symphonic and Latin and brass and big band, um, but there's sort of. An, of an elegance in the syncopation that you do in, in the style that you do. It, it kind of reminds me of two things. Uh, very much the Yellow Jackets as a quartet had that approach without, with, with four instruments. Mm -hmm. And then um, there was an album that you may know of that came out in the seventies by Michel Colombier. Uh, and, and it, it was, it's, it's out of print. But it Is had it, all these phenomenal fusion albums. Uh, it artists. wasn't Wings, or um, no, was it was, it was no. not Wings. That was a separate oh, album. This was an album that had had Mike Brecker, Jocko, Lee Rittenauer, uh, Peter Erskine. Um, you know, a who's who of fusion, right? And and I actually I found a copy that I purchased an LP, a vinyl online the other day, and I bought it, and I've been listening to it, and it kind of reminded me of that that sensibility for large ensemble but they're using fusion artists hmm. how how do you make that happen because it, it seems like uh something that you wouldn't necessarily put together and yet you do it so beautifully well michelle was a great writer and you know gill um toward the end of his life was was uh, in his big bands were also using electric instruments so you know we I think we all see it as a as a as a different type of a color, mm -hmm. um, and and maybe you know when you're talking about synthesizers in particular, yeah, it's a color, but it's you know it also could be a particular attitude toward playing. But the question is whether those instruments guide your musical decisions, or whether you you make your musical decisions and have those instruments color them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and so right, a part of it you know, to working across all of those styles is to be familiar with the language and um, expectations of the, of the style. And I don't think that it was ever uh, my aim to write, um, to write flamenco music because I don't think I could ever do that accurately. Um, I'm not, I'm not a funk musician, but <laughs> some of the music that I write is funky and I'm not, mm -hmm. a, I'm not really a classical musician, but, I extract a, a lot of my language from from the Western uh, orchestral canon. So, the, you know, it's it's really a 
um, an acknowledgement and, and knowledge of, of all of these styles and how I incorporate it into my music and, and the electric instruments, uh, use of the electric instruments is, is part of that. You know, I don't think I really write fusion music either. I don't even know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. It's kind of a, a mixed bag. Yeah. Um, well, you had a couple albums on Blue Note and, uh, I'm assuming Bruce, was that a Bruce Lundvall sign? Bruce was there uh, um, during that time, and and uh, my friend Matt Pearson, who's who's now yeah. managing uh, Samara Joy's um, career, so it's I'm yeah, happy yeah. to see that he's uh, he's doing really well. So is she. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's doing. She's blowing up, as they yeah. say. Yeah, Matt, Matt, I know, uh, you know, forty years. Uh, yeah, he's uh, that was great. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce was amazing, and and I'm sure Bruce. You know, once he was introduced to your music, said, "Ah, oh, this is a guy. I, I need, I need to sign this artist," mm -hmm. and that was great. So you were there, and then I, I saw you had a couple albums that I, I listened to in the past on Act, a great out, right, great label out of Germany, uh, and then yeah. the more the the new album on a very interesting label that we're seeing a lot of great music from, and that yes. is BMG Modern Recordings, right, uh, and Olympians uh, with uh, Metropole Orchest. Um, I guess as a, I don't know if it's in contrast to some of the albums you did before, but this was, this was, am I correct to say this is a Metropole as the orchestra and the band with a bunch of really incredible guest artists? That's right. Yeah. Well, this is the, I started with the Metropole in 1995 as a guest conductor and I became the, the, uh, the chief in 2005. Mm -hmm. And uh, since you know 2013 2014 when when i left as the uh the chief i had written quite a bit of music uh for the orchestra and uh, we never really made a proper recording of the compositions that i wrote mm -hmm. uh, for the orchestra over the years so we used the um the uh the the, the i guess the uh constrictions of the pandemic as a as a reason f for going into the studio with the orchestra since we weren't able to to uh to be out on the stage mm -hmm. and um the restrictions weren't as as uh, as shall we say strict in the netherlands mm -hmm. as as they mm -hmm. were in other places so we were able to do string section and wind section mm -hmm. recordings and um without also, masks uh, well right <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can you can do that in other places of the world, right? Yeah. So the the, the Metropole Orchestra, for those of you who don't uh, know out there, um, as uh, was was formed in 1945, and wow. um, at, at, in the service of the radio, Netherlands radio, and um, they really became the the only full time jazz and pop orchestra in the world. And uh, so since then, of course, they've they've made a, a ton of recordings and been out on on stage and tours and and all of that. And um, so um, I, I'm I was very happy to be a part of of this orchestra for for uh, decades now. And we had a lot of music, so I thought we would um, pick uh, eight of the hits and um, and invite some of our friends. Uh, to to come and sit in, and um, it really turned out to be <laughs> a lot more of an of an epic production than than uh, than originally planned. And well, you uh, have you have happened. Dave Benny, Chris Potter, Alex Acuna, Ramon Stagnaro, uh, guitarist, uh, and then two singers that are you know some of the. Two of the best singers around, Cecilia right. Clarence Savant and Diana Reeves. Yeah, uh, it's 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 uh, it's star packed, and yet there is a like most of your albums that I love so much. Uh, there, there's big sound, and then there's simplicity as well, and that that sort of dynamic is something that I think is you know yeah. from as a listener, that's your signature. It's yeah, you you get involved in big projects, and that's one of the things I did want to talk to you about. Your projects are big. I mean, they're, you know, a, a, a duo trio quartet going to the studio 
uh, you know, a couple takes. Not that it, I'm making it that it's that simple at all, especially if it's magnificent music that we love to listen to. But yours are big productions. They're, explain how that, how that your approach to that as you construct an album and going into the studio and all the things that go into that. Well, this one was was complicated, but it was also easy because the music uh, had been written for this application, and uh, and the, and quite a bit of the music we still play on the stage. So they they had a lot of the music under their fingers before we went uh, we went into the studio, and 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 we still enjoy playing some of these pieces as overtures for other other artists uh, concerts, and and so that that part of it was easier. The difficult part, of course, was the technical aspect of it. Um, just having to, to put it together, not playing all together in the same room. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, one violinist at a time kind of ordeal mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the way that other records have been made um, over the COVID period, but uh, it still was, was complicated uh, to do and to get the soloists in there. But you say star packed it it's it really um part of uh the jazz sensibility is to have a community of of people that you love to work with and and uh that resonate with your music and, and in that way it was it was sort of easy too and you know i, I don't I, I don't want to underestimate how difficult it is to play some of this music but but I think that the, uh, the all of the artists you mentioned were familiar with with my music and uh, and had definitely had something to say about it. Um, do I uh, mostly do big complicated projects? Yeah, why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the way it turns out. You know, I I, I like a big room. Yeah, well, we're glad you do. So. Um, I read somewhere that one of the great musicians that you've worked with the longest, Peter Erskine. Yeah. Uh, was he in your original big band? The, uh, or the, uh, the LA big band. Yeah. The, the, well, I, I had a, a few drummers, the original uh, drummer in the, uh, in the LA uh, big band was Ralph Humphrey mm. from uh, at the, uh, group freefall and uh, the bassist jim lacefield they were the original and then the the longest standing drummer in that band was peter donald mm. uh, the drummer with the the uh toshiko akiyoshi big band who's a dear friend of ours and uh so peter really wasn't in that la okay big band because he lived in new york at the time and then he moved out to LA right about the time that I, I basically realized that I would never make any money if I kept this band together. And so I started <laughs> working on, on other projects, but, um, he, um, uh, Pete played on the, on the first New York big band recording. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then he played on the subsequent, uh, start here and in instructions and wow, he played, yeah, he just played on really most of my recordings and, um, you know, he just had a has a great sense of, of of color and space, and and working in the studio um, as a great ally because he has a has a, an amazing ear and and he knows the pacing of of takes and you know when you can push people to to get more and and you know he he has a good sense of of that studio uh, discipline that's uh, so easy to lose when you're in the moment and, and you, you really want to get something and you forget about everybody in the room and that everybody sometimes is a, is a large everybody. Yeah. So, I, and I, I often describe Peter, one of my favorite people and favorite musicians, uh, as probably one of the few drummers in the world that can play on a fairly eclectic ECM record and also do Steely Dan, Hey 19. Right. Yeah. Uh, which is just, I mean, that the breadth of, yeah. of his abilities is just fantastic. Yeah. Cause he, he's always listening and he, he wants to make it right. And, and he has, he has the ability to absorb um, styles 
um, but his ability to be to sit in the middle of a room with with a huge orchestra and the red light goes on and you know everything is there and it feels good but he's aware of everything that's going on in the room and, and that's a you know one of the aims of having the the drummer there is to bring all of the elements uh, together uh, into a, a unified grooving whole <laughs> yeah did, did peter ever tell you the story how he snuck into his first music school he was underage so i i can't remember where it was it was some music camp and uh, his dad signed him up but he was at least five years underage for the youngest kid they had but when he arrived they, they didn't want to turn him away and he was this you know like toddler with all these kids who were serious and in in the in that camp that year was you know Dave Sanborn and other kids yeah um, but he that was his that was his foray into I'm going to be a great musician so did he play uh, he did he did all right but uh, he, he a, was what, how old was he oh it was it was Six? something ridiculous i don't want to say <laughs> toddler he was probably i guess <laughs> maybe like 7 or 8 yeah. Um, there's this photo that he gave me that I actually ran in the magazine of it's a it's a like a group shot, like a class shot of and you could it's a literal who's who when they were kids in this summer camp. Mm -hmm. I'll have to send it to you. It's 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 oh, a great please, photo. Please do. Yeah. Um, so but, you know, what most people don't talk about is you're you're a, a instrumentalist as well. Multi instrumentalist. You play guitar, you play keyboard, you play trumpet. Right. Yeah. Guitar um, was my first instrument. Um, and trumpet was my last instrument. <laughs> <laughs> you put them down. Um, right. I, I just felt that um, I still have it over here, and I might, I might actually pick it up again just to, to you know, feel some kind of physical uh, sense of, of operating an instrument. Uh, but uh, for those of you who play the trumpet out there in Jazz Is Land, uh, it's a it's an unforgiving instrument. <laughs> And um, if you're yeah. not playing it all the time, it's just ugly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so, I don't know if you know, but in the 90s, I had a record label in, in the Verve Group. And uh, my partner was Lee Rittenauer. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and so I would go out with Lee a lot. And I've been playing guitar, you know, for 60 years. Great. And I, I still suck. Um, and so people would ask me, you know, they go, well, you play, you play an instrument too. I'm like, no, 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 I don't. I, I do not play an instrument. I'm so bad that I don't even mention it. I don't think so, uh, Michael. Uh, I'm sure that you're good. No, it's, it's, I'm bad enough to brag about it. Mm. <laughs> well, at this point, I, I, I'm a member of trumpet players anonymous, but there's a, <laughs> a large group of, of ex trumpet players who uh, turned out to be composers. And, and um, so I'm proud to be of that. Well, of good that good club to be in. Yeah. Any, any players that uh, are on your bucket list that you want to uh, think about recording with? Uh, I know you've done so many projects for other artists. In fact, uh, one of my favorite ones I should mention to our audience is yeah, the Joni Mitchell album. I mean, there, it, it, it is again, a, another artist, right? I wasn't prepared to listen to another great Joni Mitchell album after yeah. being so mesmerized by, you know, a string of them in the eighties. And yeah. then your album comes out and it was just, uh, just spectacular. Yeah. Uh, well, that, any that other artists? Go ahead. Wow. That was a gift. Uh, that was the first time that I got to work with Wayne Shorter too. And, ah. and so that was a, you know, a treat of, you know, that that's an understatement of course, but just to hear, yeah, of course, his voice on my orchestrations um, is a, you know, an unspeakable uh, gift. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the Wayne of course is, um, you know, the voice in my head as a composer. And so, you know, I, I owe him a debt of gratitude for so many reasons, but to, to, to have um, met him on that, project and uh have him play on on those pieces you know and to hear his his singular vision too of of poetry and and mystery the way that he he operates inside of a song 
Uh, he, he, you're right. I mean, there, there's something about Wayne that he had this, this vision, like you, that, to use your word, about approach to a song. You know, you probably heard the classic story about his solo performance on the, the title track Asia on Steely Dan record. You know, I mean, he had this vision for that solo that no one else could have thought of. No. And no. everyone still talks about it today. What, 30 yeah. years later? Yeah. And when you're, when you're listening to that solo, listen to, you know, he's operating on another plane, <laughs> just rhythmically <laughs> speaking. And, you know, he, he's, he's telling you another part of that story that you haven't heard yeah. yet in the lyric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, such a, an incredible solo. I still go back to listen to it. Uh, but and you can you can make the connection between his solo in that piece and the solos that he plays on his own records and sure. uh, Blakey and Weather Report in particular the kind of solos mm -hmm. that he plays uh, in the songs are about as he said you know mystery you know that playing yeah. like you don't know you know and, and such an inspiration for other young artists I remember the first time I sat down with Esperanza Spalding. Uh, we were talking about artists that she loved. And when I mentioned Wayne, I mean, she got emotional. She's like, you know, you have no idea what an effect he had on, on me. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And, you know, to get to know him over the years and, you know, hear his, 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 uh, his words of guidance and mm -hmm. you know, philosophy. And, you know, it was really all about the drama of it all. You know the stories, mm -hmm. and I, I can you know remember the 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 times that we actually spoke about the nuts and bolts of music. You know, were were like this. You know, yeah, the the scales and intervals, and you know, we never talked about that. We would talk about the the bigger things, the stories, and the the, the mystery, and you know you know, weaving in and out and movement in the universe and, and all the rest of that. Uh, but you, you realize that in the way that he plays on, on everything else. Yeah. That that's how we know that it's Wayne. Yeah. That I, I, I love to say it's all connected. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, it's amazing. So what's on the horizon. So we have this new great album that everyone should check out. It's, it's, there's a couple tracks on there that, you know, were so classic that I was, I can't, I can't stop listening to them. I actually have a copy right here. I have a copy on vinyl. Yes. Yeah. And All right. uh, I haven't opened this one yet because I've been listening to it on wave files, but there it's just, it sounds great. Oh, uh, I can't and, wait. Uh, Michael, that's my first, this is my first uh, vinyl. As really, a, as a solo artist, I, I, because it, you know, I made records in the days where people were were throwing out their vinyls. <laughs> no, I, I I I brought back my vinyl. So my son housed in his place. I don't know, like twelve, fifteen thousand record albums that I collected over my life. Yeah, and I couldn't get rid of them. Uh, and I, I he recently moved out of that place. And said, "Dad, you got to come get your stuff." So I went. I went through the album collection and I started pulling out like stuff that was never reissued, and mm. got a new turntable. And I am just loving the vinyl renaissance. Yeah, yeah, me too. And this, yeah, it's yeah. just. And I'm starting to. I'm starting to buy the uh, the old ones too. You know, the, the records that I've always wanted to have that. Uh, you know, to fill out the collection of vinyls, and I'm not, I'm not much buying CDs. Um, these yeah, days. yeah. I maybe reflect uh, the uh, the record buying public, but, and also uh, I might add that on Friday of this week we are um, making the uh, the vinyl master for Epiphany, and oh. it was the first uh, vinyl made of Epiphany because we didn't make vinyls for the same reason when epiphany came out in 98 so um there's going to be a vinyl available for epiphany oh. sometime hopefully in well, the I, future and yeah found uh, uh, it, you found the original masters yeah we found the original uh, well i had i had the original mixtapes 
up in back of those boxes there uh, from uh, from Epiphany. And we had to go in the other day and listen to them again because I wasn't there were some edits that we made and and uh, different takes of mixes. And I didn't remember anything. Um, producers out there, make sure you you're making better notes than we made in 1998. Um, yeah, it's it. I, you know, I've listened to that album. Um, you know, in the of course on CD, but in the streaming era, uh, I listened to it over and over again, and I, I can't wait to hear it on vinyl. I, yeah, I it's, just you know to hear it again at, at Bernie Grunman's. Uh, just the tapes, it, it sounds so beautiful, and the the air of of abbey road and and the you know the sound of the instruments and the 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 sound of the lso and you know incredible the drums you know, yeah. the drums peter <laughs> yeah, yeah peter. No, that was yeah. wonderful well yeah, so the to answer your question i'm i finished the last uh, arrangement for a record that we're doing with raul midon oh, and yeah. the wdr big band of uh, boleros and it, it came wow. from uh, a discussion that Raul and I, I had had for many years of songs from his childhood and um, the the tradition of the Cuban bolero and, and how those boleros, that, that tradition was extended into other countries, uh, Mexico and, and Argentina uh, in, in in terms of uh, of Raul's uh, experience, and uh, so we picked out eight uh, songs, uh, and I arranged them for the big band, and Raul sang, and and they're really super beautiful, <laughs> wonderful stories, uh, very traditional uh, songs um, told in a different way, and um, so we we uh, we did a, a live concert of that music in december and then i i'm adding a couple of uh, more songs to to round out the cd that we're going to record in, in may and, and so uh, you think it'll be out in summer uh probably not maybe the fall and i'm going to try to see if we can do some touring next year of this music and it's i think it's a, it will be a beautiful show so that's the that's coming up, and then um, in the uh, in the September, we're doing a project uh, uh, of uh, Curtis Mayfield music um, with Lettucey and um, and Bilal. Wow! And the uh, and the uh, radio uh, symphony of uh, of the German radio in in Cologne in September. Wow! And wow. Uh, and we're also doing a, a tribute to Prince in, in August, which was a, a project that I had written um, a couple of years ago. And the, the concert has been rescheduled three times because of COVID. So we're finally going to do it. And uh, for those. Is that with Metropol? No, with the WDR. That's WDR. Okay. Yeah. We're doing a tour with the Metropol after, after that Prince. Uh, project uh, with the Metropole and Richard Bona for a, oh, it's a 10 Richard. day tour. So um, those of you who are interested in that program. Oh um, yeah. Now Richard Bona is, he's something, you know, I, I saw him uh, when he was touring with Pat uh, Matheny and uh, I remember they, they broke out in one part of the show to do the first Pat Matheny, the trio record with Jocko. Yeah. And so, oh. Richard was doing the Jocko parts uh -huh. and was like, I didn't think anyone else could do those. He's fearless. Yeah. He's fearless. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. Um, wonderful bass player, beautiful singer. Yeah. And, uh, and it really writes beautiful songs as yeah. well. So we're, we're doing a lot of those songs on the, on the concert. He's, he's mostly singing. Yeah. Great. Also playing the bass, but it's, it's all it's mostly about his singing and his, his songs. That's great. Well, yeah. it was absolutely wonderful to have you on the show, Vince. Thank you, Michael. It was great to uh, see uh, you again. Absolutely. And uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. I hope so. You know where to find me. Uh, back, absolutely. Right you, here you with, know where the, to... with the scores and the LPs. 
<laughs> okay. We'll see you soon. All right. Take care, Michael. Thank you.